The Global Energy Leaders Podcast, episode 75. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray, and today we bring back on Dr. David Grantham. If you missed his last appearance, we will link to it in the show notes, but a quick refresher. Dr. Grantham got a Bachelor of Art in History from University of South Florida. He has a Master of Science in International Relations from Troy, and he has a PhD in Modern History from Texas Christian University. We will link to all of his websites and Facebook, Twitter, in the show notes, so be sure to check that out. And just a reminder, he is a leading expert in national security matters and international affairs with specializations in Latin America and the Middle East, which is why we brought him on to talk about just those things. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. David Grantham. Well, Dr. Grantham, since the last time we talked about Texas energy, uh, a lot has changed around the world, especially in Venezuela, but we're glad to have you on to talk to us about today. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. And for the listener's point of view, we are recording this on July 31st, and um, last night um, there was a lot of news about Venezuela and what's going on down there. Uh, kind of take us, you know, 30,000 foot, uh, what's going on down there and what should we be focusing on? Yeah, the, the Venezuela problem has, has become a, um, I don't want to say it wasn't a disaster to begin with, but it's been like a slow-moving uh disaster and and the latest development has come in the in the last few days where the president has president uh Madero has essentially what he what he's attempting to do is is create yet another sham election as Nikki Haley called it and I think rightfully so where he's trying to further his power, further his, his agenda by creating this constitutional assembly or, or, um, or a government entity that will uh, supposedly vote objectively on, on new measures that will uh, give him and his party more power. And, uh, and these, these votes, these elections, these, these bodies that he keeps convening are, are really just his cohorts, and uh, it's assured that the votes will... Uh, be in his favor. So as, as uh, like I said, as Nikki Haley called it, it's really just sham elections. So that's really the the first, most recent event. Yeah, and so as someone you know sitting up here in America looking down, I know President Trump has come out and said that they are not going to acknowledge the results of the election and maybe issue some sanctions on Venezuela as well. Um, but what does that mean, you know, for for just kind of a geopolitical picture? Um, other nations around the world, wh- what is their take on what's happening in Venezuela? Obviously, you know, just because the U.S. thinks something does not mean that's what the rest of the world thinks. Right. The, well, the Venezuelan problem is. Uh, there's uh, several different avenues you can look at to determine why this matters for U.S. security, for international security. Uh, and I, I argue it's one of the more important issues in the world at the moment. For one, uh, the region is becoming increasingly unstable. Mexico, if you look from Mexico south, so through Central America and into the northern tier of South America where Venezuela is at, there's there's a tremendous um, tremendous instability in those areas. Uh, so if you look at Central America, for example, we are deporting. When I say we, the U.S. and the Obama or the uh, Trump administration is deporting uh, a lot of gang members back to El Salvador. El Salvador is already faced with uh, with crippling uh, economic conditions. Uh, so sending sending these guys back are going to it's going to cause problems. South of that, you have Venezuela. Now, where you have people leaving Venezuela, going into neighboring Colombia, and uh, Colombian officials have already said we can't sustain uh, what they anticipate to be more refugees coming over. Uh, and then you look north of Mexico, and Mexico this this year has had uh, a, a, an increase in murder rates, especially among journalists, which is a really frightening uh, uptick in violence there. So when you look at that, you're, you're seeing a, uh, an increasing instability right south of our border. So that one is is a, is a should be a major concern for U.S. Uh, officials and for Americans at large. 
Right. And, and if we step back and we say, okay, um, one of some of the reports have been, you talk about you know, people leaving Venezuela, um, I've seen is that people are, are stockpiling food there and they're, you know, they're, they're prepared for the worst. And it sounds like what you're saying is, is that you're already seeing some of the effects of that. And if you step back, you just talk about security. One of the things that, um, especially here in the U.S., when you look at like pipeline security, um, is you have, if you have people that are crossing the border illegally, especially, uh, they will use pipeline right of or electrical line right of as modes of transportation because they're maintained, they're easy to travel, um, you know, let Less, less things in your way, uh, which means that you're endangering your grid just because you have people who are trying to navigate illegally across your borders. Yeah, that's that's the you bring up a good point that very few people are talking about is the the interconnectivity of our infrastructure in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, if you recall the blackout several years ago that that took out New York City for for a few days. That actually reached into Canada and caused problems in Canada, and, and few people uh, realized that. And, and obviously, the news was more focused on New York City because that's a hub of, of international commerce and whatnot. But we we are we have a uh, incredibly uh, an incredible system that's becoming increasingly interconnected. So these pipelines, uh, energy distribution networks, financial networks, roads. Uh, international trade ports, I mean, you name it. And, it. and we're in a world where something like the Ebola crisis in Africa somehow hopped across the Atlantic and ended up in Dallas-Fort Worth. So you really have to take a look at, at how these things um, are panning out elsewhere and see where those connectivities, uh, uh, you know, merge with the United States' interests. So I think you bring up a really good point. You bring up a good point there about the interconnectivity and, and kind of where I was going is, um, you know, some of the reports from Mexico, obviously there is the, and you have the crime issue, but you also have that their economy seems that it may be getting some legs underneath it, um, especially that's large in part, I would say, due to the reforms in the energy sector. And so you're seeing U.S. companies that are looking to invest dollars, entrepreneurs, uh, big companies as well, that are looking to go down there. They're building pipelines across the border. Um, and so when you see a company like Venezuela, who is a large you know, they're, they can be at least a powerful player in the energy community. Um, basically, I, I don't want to, you know, be uh, too 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 much hyperbole here, but they're 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 falling apart at the seams. Um, and you see Mexico, who's maybe trying to get their legs. Um, you're shifting populations. It looks like that this could actually be a uh, a drag on the Mexican economy, which might actually have a chance to turn the corner with some of their energy reform. Yeah, I, I, w- I would agree with some of that, and I would I would point out too that. Um, where Mexico and Venezuela, their economies, and I say this just uh, as someone who's not a economist per se, but someone who's just studied the history of, of the region, that uh, Venezuela, their export, their economy is and was oil. And any fluctuation in the market could send them uh, in, a, in a downward spiral. Iran is in a similar similar situation. So they have to depend uh, on that export where Mexico has the ability to be more diverse. So the, the, their energy sector could very well uh, fuel other operations, and, um, but the criminal activity and the increase, it seems, in parts of Mexico with the violence could uh, hamper those other industries that could support uh, the energy sector and keep Mexico from becoming a Venezuela where they're depending on one major export to fuel their entire economy. I just read an article a few days ago about uh, another shipment of Ford cars from the Ford factories there in Mexico that uh, were stuffed with drugs. Uh, there, there, there is a, a, there's a problem there, and I'm not sure how they're going to go about fixing that. Well, you know, one thing that you, you talk about, that you talk about Venezuela and their exports uh, being you know, oil is the, is the main driver of their economy. One thing that gets lost in these discussions is when you look at Venezuela, and, and I don't care what side of the, the political aisle you come on, uh, if you come in you say, well, um, you know, the U.S. is going to levy sanctions against the, you know, Venezuela, may not buy as much oil or any of their oil, um, that's going to hurt the, the new leadership, whether whether you think they're doing the right, wrong, or it doesn't really matter. And I think one of the things as far as energy professionals we kind of get we kind of lose is that that means that people in Venezuela could go hungry. And so it's just sad to see that, you know, a government could make decisions um, like they're doing, you know, hold fake elections, and then ultimately the people 
who really have nothing to do with this are going to pay the price, and then they're going to have to be forced to leave because now they're hungry, they need a job, they need to support their family, they're trying to do the right thing, and so they go to Colombia or Mexico or back in the U.S., and all of a sudden you see, we talk about trickle-down economics, well, this is a trickle-down as well because people who are, you know, who are being hostile to their own people um, and are, are hurting their own economy ultimately hurt the economies of other places because those people are now forced to leave just to provide basic necessities. Yeah, that, that's the age-old debate on sanctions is whether whether taking money away from a country is worth the the consequences for the population who, as you mentioned, is by and large innocent of the uh, of the atrocities or the just the activities of their government in many cases. However, <clears throat> the the idea that sanctions somehow take money and food away from these people kind of misses the overall point that with the government in power, those people have, in most cases, had food and money taken away anyway. If you look at the history of Iraq and Saddam Hussein, there was a creative measure intended to uh, circumvent that consequence with oil for food. And what ended up happening was just yet another uh, duplicitous uh, operation by the uh, uh, by Saddam Hussein and his henchmen, to where the people were still not receiving the benefits of this oil for food. They still weren't receiving the food, any kind of funding that came along with that. So it is a tough, tough position to take, and I'm reading today that the U.S. will, in fact, um, hit Venezuela with more sanctions, and which is unfortunate for the people. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of Venezuelans in the United States that would probably say, you know what, that needs to happen because whether the whether U.S. money flows in or not, Madero is not going to redistribute that to the people. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of got mixed views on the sanctions. Um, you know, this kind of depends on the time and place because, like you point out with the oil for food program, you know, you go in there, you try to do the right thing, and then the dictator still doesn't do it. And so it's a it's a complex, nuanced debate. I just always like to bring it back to we got to make sure as energy professionals or anyone that uh, we 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 can get into the U.S. versus Venezuela or this versus that, and we almost forget that there's people that are involved in energy um, touches people on all levels. And so that's just you know some of the things that we got to keep. In, we, we want to have nuanced views, like you point out. You, you go, okay, well, there's some pros here and there's some pros there. But let's transition a little bit to the Middle East, uh, an area where sanctions from the U.S. standpoint are, are definitely common. Um, there's a lot of, lot going on there. Kind of give us, you know, what are you, what's your take on what's been happening in the Middle East? You have um, Iran and you have the Saudis, and it seems like um, these interests are trying to align, but it, 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 at least from my standpoint, it feels like they're, they're struggling to figure out where they want to go down the, uh, down the next five to ten years. Yeah, you know, the, the the Middle East region is is man, it, it is a complicated animal, especially uh, since the recent uh, separation or or uh, the the diplomatic fallout from uh, from Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which was essentially, uh, and this is more simplistic, but for the sake of time, essentially was Saudi Arabia responding to uh, Qatar's activity and their funding of groups like ISIS. Uh, and that came on the heels of the Trump administration of the President Trump's visit to the region and to Saudi Arabia. And so that that is one major development there that could very well affect how energy, uh, you know, the price of energy, the, the deals or the um, deliberations at OPEC. Uh, but the the recent, more recent event that seems to have brought Saudi Arabia back to its roots has been this debate over the Temple Mount in uh, in Jerusalem, and and where, for your listeners, where two uh, Israeli police officers were shot and killed, and Israel responded by putting up metal detectors for those coming in in and out of the Temple Mount, and uh, the Palestinians took exception to this. Palestinian authorities and and other uh, pro-Palestinian countries in the region there and Saudi Arabia has responded as uh, saying that uh, the uh, what they're calling the internationalization of the Temple Mount is a violation of, of international law and then there's a bunch of debates that go on with that but the point is Saudi Arabia went from a went from uh, cutting off Qatar because of their uh, you know alleged terrorist connections to swinging back again to speaking very boldly and aggressively toward Israel. So 
the Trump administration has has set up real stand with Israel, and they have also just signed a very big military uh, deal with Saudi Arabia. All these things are going to complicate how we address that region, and it's going to complicate uh, how the uh, oil uh, markets respond to it all. Yeah, and, and and I guess for me that when you look at the Middle East, it seems like we almost are our own worst enemy there. You know, it seems like we we try to work out a deal with this group and that group. And as you mentioned, um, all these nations and inside the nations are different tribal groups that have different beliefs and as far as how they view it, uh, what, what what should be going on and how much they get along. It it, it seems like sometimes our involvement there. Um, now we can debate on how how um, involved we should be, but our involvement there because we have our hands in so many different pies, we sometimes it kind of, it seems like we almost work against ourselves. Yeah, this, that, that's been a. There's a long history of of U.S. activity in the Middle East that it it's hard to hard to reconcile some of it. It's hard to understand the reasoning behind some of it, and and a lot of it has to do with the traditional. Uh, I'll say a lot, but but there's there's several instances where traditional diplomacy, wherein uh, I define that as solutions that are not necessarily good or bad. They're just what needed to happen at the time. Uh, like, you know, we were, we saddled up next to Stalin in World War II, not because we probably wanted to or, or knew that it would be helpful going forward, but, but it was the right thing at that right, at that right time. And the Middle East becomes a lot of those stories where you say, we know we made this decision at this moment because it was the best thing at this moment and it wasn't necessarily going to be, you know, fruitful going forward. Uh, now, I will say that the one con- constant in this is Israel, and Israel is a very pro-American, free market, uh, stable uh, country politically, economically. The Palestinians depend on Israel to be economically strong, which is why this divest movement is so wrong-headed in that it's attempting to take down an Israeli economy that the people they supposedly are trying to help, it would hurt them. So Israel is a constant. And I think when you, when you break everything down in the region, you break down all the U S policy, that's the one that, that regardless of where we stand, that's always going to be a, um, a, a problem with others in the region. And it's one that we should stick with. One, we should stand by Israel because of their government, because of their economy, because of who they are. And that, but we've got to recognize that oftentimes that's what it's going to come back to. And that's a principle that I think we should fight for. That's a principle we should stand on. Okay, so final thing for you, you, you brought up the Saudis and what's going on with Israel. Um, you know, I think some people thought that maybe President Trump was going to kind of push back Saudi relationships before he got into office, and it doesn't seem that that's going to be the case. Do you think he's handling the Saudis in the right way, or are you a little disappointed with his policy uh, in regards to the Saudis? Well, I, I'm, I'm holding judgment until, until I feel a bit more. Um, I, I, was, I wasn't terribly pleased with uh, with how friendly he approached or, or how open he was with them when he traveled overseas. But then the the relationship with Saudi made a very big mood with the relationship with Qatar. Um, and then President Trump decided to delay the U.S. embassy's move uh, to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv for six months. Um, I, I wasn't terribly pleased with that decision, and I wasn't... Uh, terribly pleased with with how cordial um, it was, at least in appearances. I thought he should be a little bit more stern publicly with Saudi Arabia. Uh, But it looks like the benefit, whatever was talked about behind closed doors, resulted in, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia taking a hard stance against Qatar. And one thing that your listeners should consider with Saudi Arabia is regardless of how they act, they are... They are opposed, they are, for all intents and purposes, an enemy of Iran. Iran and Saudi Arabia do not like each other. So again, it's one of those, my enemy is an enemy is my friend, I guess you could say. Not to call Saudi Arabia an enemy, but but the point being, they are a bulwark in the region against Iran. So you, you pick your poison with that one. 
Right, right. Yeah, you, you're saying okay. If, if you're if you're looking at it, you're almost saying um, Iran. It might be the lesser of two evils, or or some kind of analogy like that, where you say, okay, well, we got to side with someone, and we don't want to side with Iran, so we could pick the Saudis. Um, I, I know I said last question, but I I just thought about this. I was going to ask you about it. Um, I saw a report a maybe about. Uh, two or three weeks ago, they said that ISIS is actually um, falling apart because of the low oil prices that they, they, they can't make money. And so, um, you know, the whole Qatar thing and what's going on there with them funding them, uh, it seems that ISIS may actually fall apart just because of low oil prices. Have you heard any of that, and what are your thoughts on that? I've heard bits and pieces of that, and, and those are uh, – it's interesting. The theory is interesting, but it's it's so difficult to determine that, um, short of – short of having sources on the ground that can report back to you about specific financial developments within ISIS and their, and their profit making, it's really hard to determine uh, how legitimate a claim that is, but it makes sense on it. Uh, at its on face value, it makes sense. Right. Because that- they, you know, ISIS makes a lot of money, pri- almost, I would say a majority of their funds come from, uh, or at least came from oil. They controlled many oil fields. So uh, if the price of oil is going down and if Turkey and Syria who and Bashar al-Assad, who were their primary purchasers, if, if they can't get the price that they need, uh, they're, they're, they're really a one-hit wonder when it comes to their, uh, their profitability, and, it, and it's all based on oil. Right, that's what kind of those were kind of my thoughts as well. As I was like, it, 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 I can see why this would make sense, but I just don't have enough information to really cast a judgment on there. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I know you've kind of moved around since we last spoke to you, so why don't you let the listeners know where they can find you uh, if they want to keep up between your uh, vis- appearances on our show? Yeah, you can uh, you can follow me uh, on Facebook, uh, David Grantham. You can also follow me on Twitter, David underscore Grantham, the number one. You can also visit my website drdavidgrantham.com Okay, and we will link to all of that in the show notes for the listeners, and uh, you talk about a lot of stuff that's you know quite interesting. I, I'm here in Texas where we live. Uh, there was just a terrible case the other day of um, human trafficking and uh, some folks that they found in the back of a 18-wheeler down in San Antonio. I know you were talking about that. So uh, you talk about a lot of stuff and uh, a good follow on Facebook and Twitter and uh, your website. So we will link to that in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on, and we look forward to having you on again next month. Hey, thanks for having me. Enjoyed the conversation with Dr. Grantham today, and question of the day, Venezuela, what do you think will ultimately happen? Will the sanctions work and um, be able to you know, slow down maybe what this government's doing, or will the sanctions be something that, you know, like they have been historically, maybe not that big of a deal? Love to hear your thoughts. Ryan at GlobalEnergyMedia.com. That's Ryan at GlobalEnergyMedia.com. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 